Hi, thank you for joining us today. I'm Gabe, the founder of Beach Lex. This is Pranjal, our secretary and outreach manager. Um, we are both high school students, and today we'll start with your background and then transition into ocean conservation and your overall message to our viewers. Um, so can you please start by introducing yourself and telling us why you decided to pursue marine conservation, and please tell us about your personal and educational background. Sure. So first of all, thanks for having me, guys. I love making new connections and especially with students because I feel like that's where all of this passion can really be transferred into what you want to do for the rest of your life. So um, I feel really excited to speak with you guys today. My name is Laurel Irvine. I am the Development and Communications Director at Shark Allies. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit that focuses on the conservation of sharks and rays, um, mostly in regards to overfishing in the shark fin trade, but we have a couple other things that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, my story is, I guess, not your typical one, but um, I grew up in Los Angeles and my family was in the film industry. And so um, being on set all the time when I was younger, I wanted to be what my dad was um, and work on set and make movies. And so I went to Boston University for um, undergrad to be a film production major. And I had so much fun doing that, but I was always in like producing and writing classes. And I really just loved being behind the camera and doing cinematography. Um, and of course my whole life growing up in LA and surfing and diving and what have you, I thought um, I would love to do something in the ocean space, but I never had confidence in myself that I had a science mind. Ooh, sorry, one second. Um, and so I kind of discouraged myself from going after a marine biology degree, not having complete confidence in my abilities. And um, then I ended up going abroad to Australia. And before I went to Australia, I got my scuba diving license here in Los Angeles at Catalina Island. And I immediately thought, oh my gosh, I really messed up. <laughs> uh, it's too late to change my major because this was junior year. Um, but in Australia, I didn't study through Boston University. I went to the University of New South Wales. Um, so I actually wasn't allowed to take any requirements to go towards my film degree. And I ended up taking marine bio and oceanography and of course, diving the Great Barrier Reef. We dove in the Sydney Harbor where it's really sharky. Um, we went out to Manly Beach and a bunch of other really cool destinations. And I tried to, in my head, kind of think, how can I start blending the two of these two passions? Um, I think that something in the film industry felt a lot more secure job-wise to get benefits and have something a little bit more steady. And it was kind of scary to then think maybe I will be freelance and blend the two and either be an underwater camera woman or what have you. Um, but yeah, long story short, I came back to LA after college and I started um, going to as many like ocean conservation events as I could in the area and kind of tapping into that audience and that network, um, which is actually a huge network in LA. I had no idea. And um, I, start, I went to the Patagonia Film Festival, like the clothing store, and uh, a group, Shark Allies, who I'm now with, um, had a really great short on um, basically how the media portrays shark attacks or shark encounters. And um, I was just writing down a million organizations and filmmakers and cold calling and cold emailing people. And Stephanie Brendel, our executive director, got on the phone with me for, I think, I think it was like a three hour conversation. It was so long and I was so gracious that she took so much time. Um, and we talked about different career paths and what have you, and then came to the conclusion that why don't I just start volunteering? I have all of these marketing and filmmaking and more visual design skills that I could bring to the table. And um, after proving myself for a couple years, it turned into a full-time job and the rest is history. That's interesting. I always find it cool when people combine um, different fields and I never think you could do something with film and ocean conservation. Yeah, I felt very helpless, I guess, um, watching so many documentaries because again, I didn't study it full time in school. And so I was trying, I was so interested in it and really excited to learn for honestly, like the first time. And I was just watching all the documentaries, reading all the articles and books I could and felt very helpless that a lot of 
these films and outlets didn't give an action plan. They kind of just dumped the problem on you and then you're felt feeling, okay, this is too big for me to help. Um, and so I, we were thinking more so along the lines when I was talking to Stephanie and started volunteering is how can we, and this is really truly the root of shark allies is how can we get everybody on board? How can we give everybody a voice? How can anybody, no matter what their skill, their background, where they're located, their age, anything, how can you speak up for sharks and make a difference? So, um, I think it's it's been really fun because Shark Allies is we're such a small team, um, but we get to have our hands in so many pots. And so one of the things that I actually am doing it right now is making a whole website for us. And it's just like never thought in a million years that I would be developing and coding a website, but to use your visual and uh, like user friendly eye on everything is an interesting spin to contribute each skill to conservation. You don't just have to be a policymaker or a scientist. Right, right, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so two of the biggest threats that face sharks today are overfishing and finning. Mm -hmm. So how widespread would you say this problem is on a global scale? And what could potentially happen to sharks if there was no intervention? So it is kind of a doomsday answer, which is unfortunate because as you guys know, it, sharks are basically the white blood cells of the ocean. So um, without sharks, we won't have healthy oceans and humanity needs a healthy ocean. And um, the problems of overfishing in the shark fin trade and finning and bycatch and entanglement and ocean acidification and the list goes on, unfortunately, is so huge and it's global. And so um, one thing that we try and focus on at Shark Allies is the fin trade because we feel that that is something that is kind of the pinnacle, that's the money maker, and everything else is kind of an excuse as to finning and trading fins. And so if we can put a stop to the actual trade itself, um, we feel that then it can kind of curb the demand for shark meat and squalene and liver oil and um, all of that type of stuff. So it is, it's very devastating to hear the statistics all the time. I mean, it's a, it's a conservative estimate to say that 100 million sharks die every year for the fin trade. Um, and that number is mind boggling to most people. It was mind boggling to me in the beginning because you think there's 100 million sharks in the ocean and then we're taking that, that's crazy. So there's gotta be so many more than that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And you would think that uh, it, the markets being in Asia and other countries abroad that we wouldn't have um, kind of our, our hands in it. And unfortunately, so long as we support the trade, we're supporting the illegal act of finning. So um, it's something that we want to kind of clean up here in the United States before we go abroad. But that's the overarching plan is to uh, make sure our backyard is cleaned up before we start helping others clean it up as well. Yeah, definitely. The fin trade is a huge problem. And hopefully by stopping that, more progress um, can be made. So shifting gears a little, Shark Allies is a part of several coalitions for various causes. How do these work and how do they help further your campaign? Mm. Great question. So Shark Allies is um, me, the executive director, and this amazing woman by the name of Andra, and then we have board members and vice presidents and everybody who are on a volunteer basis. So um, we have our work cut out for us. And um, because the threats that sharks are facing are global, we, we can't, we don't have the bandwidth to do all of it at the same time, even though that's kind of what the problem needs right now. Um, and so by, I, I personally love collaborating because um, we are such a small team. So it's, it's nice to make connections and brainstorm with people with the same mind, but a different mind at the same time. And so um, because this problem is so big, I find it so important to lift other campaigns up um, and help in any way we can, whether that is purely social media reposting um, to more of a U.S. based network for our social handles. But um, beyond that, trying to understand different governments and uh, give kind of our peace of mind of how we got things done in Florida. Maybe that would help something in the, in the European Union or 
what have you. So it's very, um, sometimes people get bogged down of wanting to be the one to make the win. But for us, any win is a win for sharks. And so we just want to help and uplift any organization that needs it. So um, this next one is kind of more just based on your opinion. For you, what has been one of the most interesting or impactful campaigns launched by Shark Allies? That's a good question. Um, I think in my time being there, I think, well, so our executive director did the first fin ban of its kind with the proper language and kind of treating it as contraband in 2010 in Hawaii. Um, and then that language was adopted for many of the other fin bans in the US. Um, and so I think that I wasn't a part of that one. I always wish I was because I think innovating that type of approach for policy would have been incredible to be a part of. But in my time at Shark Allies, um, we this time last year launched an initiative around vaccines. And so this one was super controversial and we knew that it would be. And so essentially what happened, the little story behind it is um, we, at the beginning of lockdown, we had just finished the No Fin Florida campaign. And um, we were thinking, oh, like we're on such a roll. We wanna keep helping. We wanna keep, we've got eyeballs on us now. Now's the time to launch something bigger or something, um, a way for people to help from home while we're all stuck. And um, we thought let's focus on the squalling campaign, shark free products, because that's been something that's just on our website and we've spoken about and given presentations on and what have you, but we haven't really had any solid action items on it yet. Um, and we get kind of frustrated when there isn't a specific action item. And so we thought, okay, great. Everyone's stuck at home. This is an amazing time for you to investigate your products um, and reach out to customer service. Everything was just so easy for it to be virtual. And so we were really digging into new research papers and um, we have this incredible intern, Josh, and he's um, he just graduated college, but he's in marine biology. And so we were digging into research papers together and he found um, one that had to do just one sentence purely on an old influenza vaccine that has shark squalling in it. And we went, oh shoot, this is like exactly what we're waiting for. Um, the whole world is waiting for vaccines to be developed. We really hope they're not using sharks in these. Hopefully technology has advanced. Um, and thank God that the three that are um, approved in the United States, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson do not use squalling. Um, and so, but there are a couple that are still in development that can be approved that use squalene. So the whole idea was, this is a global pandemic. The demand for sharks of finite resource, this is, cannot spell out good news. Um, so, and especially because deep sea sharks, the ones that are typically targeted for squalene are the slowest to produce. Um, and so there have been multiple case studies um, across the world that there are certain fisheries that collapse due to overfishing for squalene alone um, of these deep sea shark populations. And so we sat on the, we, we tried to as much as we could perfectly craft this messaging because it is such a sensitive subject because we never wanted to come off as anti-vaxxers. We never wanted to come off as slowing down the development of um, a COVID vaccine. It was just to purely ask these companies, um, while you're doing R&D for the future, please consider using all of these existing alternatives. Um, and so we actually sat on this information from about, gosh, I don't know, um, April until September. Um, and we finally found a great investigative reporter to help us get the message out there and perfectly craft it. And then of course, in the media, if it bleeds, it leads. And so we made all of these little estimated predictions on, okay, if it's going to be a two-dose shot, then typically X amount of squalene is used in an influenza vaccine. So we can only assume that this much would be used for a COVID vaccine. And um, the headlines everywhere were uh, half a million sharks could be killed for a COVID vaccine. And we thought, oh, gosh, that's not the messaging that we wanted. And then, of course, everyone picks it up and picks it up and picks it up. Um, and so I think that one 
was something that I had no idea the media storm uh, would happen. I don't think we were prepared for it, but we rolled with it. And, um, and we tried to it at the bottom of every post, the bottom of, I mean, you guys are on Instagram very much so, so you know how careful it is to craft messaging is I had to put a disclaimer at the bottom of everything and say, we are pro vaccine. We are not trying to slow down the progress of anything. We're just talking about the future and trying to raise awareness that sharks are literally in almost everything. They're in your skincare, they're in your vaccines, they're in your pet food. They could be in your seafood and you don't know it. So I think that one was something that's really interesting as well. Being a film major, I never thought I'd be rolling my sleeves up and getting into research papers about vaccines and big pharma and understanding how that patents and all of that work. So um, like you said earlier, it's interesting that like those two worlds blend as well. So I think that one was, um, we knew, we knew to be careful with it, but it just took on its whole, a whole new life to be honest. And uh, we're still chipping away at it and actually getting some really good progress going that we'd like to share with everybody soon. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's a weird one. It was so unintentionally timely. Yeah. But it's funny you mentioned that because I really do recall that story making or like those kinds of stories making the rounds. Yeah. yeah I remember yeah. sharks and those all over social media. Yeah. yeah. That one, um, it started, I forget what the first publication was. And then I, I had get Google alerts for all of our campaigns and keywords and what have you to keep up with everything. And um, it was going off on like TMZ and Access Hollywood. And I was just so confused why that, I was really worried that it was on the Daily Mail and all of these places that were more sensationalized and a little bit um, more gossipy. But I guess at the same time, there was no way to control it. Um, and it's good that it got out to the mainstream in some capacity, but yeah, it, it, it was yeah. a fun, it was a weird one. <laughs> and, um, building on to our last question and building on to the campaign, um, for like against the shark sharks being used in vaccines. Um, in your opinion, how do the presentations and films produced by shark allies help promote awareness and action? Yeah, so I think uh, we never want you to feel helpless. Um, so we always want anybody, no matter who you are, if you're a student, if you're an artist, if you're a photographer, policymaker, scientist, anything, to know how to take your skill and know that that is your skill and apply that to conservation. Because right now we need all hands on deck. And so it's not about... Um, giving this big, massive, devastating claim, but actually saying, here's something to do about it, or here's a conversation to start at home, or here's a presentation that we can give you to present at your school assembly. Um, because I think a lot of the things that sharks face are, uh, aside from the environmental pressures, are a bad PR image. And so I think it's really important to, I mean, just the other day I was sitting down with a friend of a friend, um, an older guy, and he he asked me, why do we need more sharks in the ocean? We have so many right now. And I had to give him the whole rundown and he had no idea, a 70 year old man, or it's somewhere in that ball, ballpark, had no idea what sh why they're important. And so it's just all about, um, and then giving him the tools to have a proper conversation because that's where it all starts. Uh, but yeah, I think that, one that's again the bread and butter of shark allies is uh here's a small problem and here's what we can do about it and here's where it fits into the bigger problem so that you don't feel helpless and like your hands are tied so it's kind of um i went down to uh marine mammal care center in los angeles this past week um to give a talk about conversational conservation and we were talking about how to lead or start a zero waste lifestyle and if you look at the whole picture and all of a sudden you're saying, I need to overhaul my entire makeup cabinet and all my skincare and throw it out and start over. That's a huge mountain of stress and things to think about. But if, if I say the second you run out of your mascara, check, check the ingredients, check the packaging and just replace it with something better. It's, we all just need to make these little steps. 
Mm -hmm, yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the role of emotion? Because a lot of the times that's important in topics like this and how important empathy is for sharks when trying to create some sort of change. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think we would have a completely different job if we were out there fighting for dolphins and whales and sea turtles. Um, I think that is what drew me a little bit more so to shark conservation is because of their importance in the ocean ecosystem, but also it seemed like a big fight <laughs> um, and a challenge. And so uh, not to say that whales and all the other animals don't have challenges. Those are huge as well, but um, at least PR wise, it is really tough to walk the halls of the legislature and say we need more sharks. So the way that we kind of spin it, at least in regards to, or sometimes you have to spin it this way, unfortunately, is it's all capitalism. So if we can talk about how um, diving brings in way more money than commercial fishing or in certain like ocean places like Florida, or um, if we can talk about how uh, it's a renewable resource to dive with sharks versus a one-time um, charge, it's all, it's all about um, not pointing fingers and saying you're wrong for fishing. It's that's what you've learned your entire life. And that's what was passed down to you and your family. And that's what puts food on the table. So let's figure out a different way to put food on the table. Um, so I think it's unfortunately with sharks, it's not necessarily emotional other than really depicting their importance in their ecosystems. I think it's a little bit more capital. Um, but for something like, um, I don't, I think you guys would really enjoy a do new documentary called The Dark Hobby. Have you heard of it? Uh, no. no, I haven't heard of it. It's, um, we posted it on our Instagram a couple weeks ago when it got released, but um, it's all about the aquarium trade. And I personally had no idea about the aquarium trade. I knew it existed, but I didn't know um, all of the threats to these fish and there's multiple studies about how fish are communicating and they have feelings and um, all of this stuff. So I think for something like that, it's really easy to put an emotional spin on it. But for um, sharks, it's a little, it's so much more polarizing. Definitely. And with movies like Jaws, everyone just thinks they're like dangerous and they want to eat you when really they don't. They're just yeah. in their own habitat. Um, so shifting gears a little, we also noticed that Shark Allies has a pretty large social media following. So how social media helped you to garner attention towards various conservation efforts? Oh, it's huge. Um, I really honestly sometimes feel like we would be nowhere without Instagram and I hate to say it, but it's, uh, it's our lifeline to everybody else. It's how, it's what got the No Fin Florida campaign, um, to see success because that's where Every time um, my boss in Florida, Stephanie, was walking the halls of the legislature and she calls me and says, everyone needs to call this representative. I quickly get on Instagram, I post an action alert, and then their phone lines are flooded. So um, aside from action alerts and being the lifeline to everybody that wants to help, it's also an incredible way to build new relationships like with Beach Lex and um, different companies that want to donate to Shark Allies to help fund our campaigns or whatever it is. It's, it's just such a, um, especially during the pandemic, it was really truly a lifeline or um, like last year for Shark Week, we, um, we typically have a really fun event in San Diego every year and we couldn't have it. And so we put everything virtual and that was a really great way to still get people excited about shark conservation during Shark Week. So, um, it really is what we depend on, truly, other than doing the actual nitty gritty work um, with talking to pharmaceutical companies or committees or policymakers or what have you. It's, it's really, truly how we stay running. Yeah, same, honestly. We wouldn't even exist without Instagram. Like, it's helped us form so many connections. Um, but yeah, it's a really great way to get people on board and to share information. Yeah. Yeah. And also engage with people. Um, there's so many times that someone reaches out and says, what's your source? And I send it to them. And then we start a conversation or um, someone has, to, it's, it, uh, there's a uh, kind of an assumption or not an assumption, I guess I should say a myth or thought out there that 
um, squalene with an E is representative of, of sharks liver oil and then with an A is all of the alternatives. So it's interesting to hear what the public thinks of different um, initiatives and campaigns and then kind of think, okay, we need to educate on this part more so now. So then we'll go down that route. So it kind of guides us in what we do as well. Mm. And so what are some other organizations that you've discovered that you guys support and that also promote awareness at, for shark conservation? For shark conservation specifically, um, well, we recently teamed up with our friends at Oceanic Preservation Society and they're helping us a lot on our shark free products campaign, um, mostly in regards to squalene, but hopefully pet food in the future. Um, there's so many. Um, Shark Project, uh, Germany and International are doing the European fin ban um, and they go under the handle Stop Finning EU, which is if anybody who's watching is in the EU and hasn't uh, spoken up yet for sharks, they need uh, quite a few more signatures before it goes, um, is considered to be heard. And then um, our friends at Shark Guardian are incredible. Um, the list is honestly endless. There's so many amazing people out there fighting for sharks. And I just feel, I feel very lucky when people want to collaborate and hear what we're doing and um, amplify us and then vice versa. Um, Beneath the Waves is incredible. They do some really amazing research out in the Caribbean for sharks um, and for tiger sharks specifically, which is our favorite. Um, so yeah, it's it's really truly endless. And there's also so many bigger incredible organizations um like we've teamed up with Surfrider la and we did a little um gray whale uh aerial presentation for world aquatic animal day and so to connect with people locally that don't necessarily focus on sharks but have a soft spot for them i think is awesome too definitely and um what is the shark allies big picture message when it comes to the protection and conservation of sharks and in other words what are the main um ideas that you want your audience to take away um about these creatures um well i mean other than i what we already said is just that we need sharks and healthy shark populations for a healthy ocean and humanity needs a healthy ocean because half of our um, breath comes from the ocean and if you really depict that to people, then they kind of put their preconceived notions about the danger of sharks aside. Um, and then on top of that, everything being action based. I never want to uh, dump all and like word vomit all of this stuff that's just so sad and so devastating onto somebody and then walk away and go, well, great, now what? Um, I always want someone to feel empowered and to know exactly what to do. So um, if you look at our I think it's sharkallies.com slash take action. Um, I'm constantly updating that to partner campaigns and coalitions and personal petitions or ways to call representatives and what have you. Because if you ever you feel like your hands are tied and you don't know what to do, just go to that page and make sure you've checked out each of those initiatives um, and either write a petition. I think there's um, incredible different uh, campaigns that need petitions and then there's other ones that need to call representatives there's other ones that are consumer based so it's it's really laid out for you right there hmm. and lastly what advice would you give to someone in our audience in high school or early college that is interested in marine biology and conservation I love that question because as I said in the beginning, I felt so lost when I was younger because I really didn't think I had a science brain. Um, and so it's not about necessarily um, being in marine bio or bust. It's it's what's your skill, what's your passion, and that's something that you. My dad always tells me like, if that's your passion, you will succeed at it because you love it and that's what you want to live and breathe and do. And so, translate that passion into something to help. So. Um, I just got off with our friend at uh, Fanatics and Olivia, who makes an incredible clothing brand, and she is so passionate about it. And so then she translates that into donating profits to shark conservation and educating a younger audience or anything of the sorts. I mean, one thing that I never realized, at least working in conservation, is the fact that uh, you really do need to run a nonprofit like a business. So going to business school is also on the table. Being a vet is on the table. Um, 
any PR is huge science communications degrees, anything like that. It's really truly just listening to yourself and trying to spin it into a passion. Definitely. And that's all of the questions we have for you today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, you had you some really great information. Thank you. I really appreciate inviting us. This was really nice.